Okay, so let's let's at least start to talk about um, uh, the the topic of the hour, and we'll we'll obviously have to continue this on um, on Tuesday. So, the topic for today officially is is heterogeneity, but heterogeneity in characteristics of a person. And I think to motivate this. Um, uh, I'm going to, to first start with a model. We have our anti-logics open, and I'd like to call up a model. I, I mentioned uh, be desirable to, to have available. It's this introductory teaching GDM version four. And some of you may remember this model because of its rather evocative um, um, visualization. Um, I'll go. Uh, help you recall it. Um, and, uh, you know, here we have uh, population uh, variant weights and, and um, uh, individuals getting pregnant and babies being born and placed in diapers and, and weight is growing and uh, individuals as falling under the risk of, of different chronic conditions, including diabetes. And we, we talked about this last time that the color coding indicated their chronic disease status. Um, this is just to help you remember this model. Now, one thing we saw last time is we looked a little bit at the logic here. And our attention last time was more kind of the different factors, you know, being characterized here and, and models of time and the fact these were hazard rates. And we, you know, noted that the colors on the screen were corresponded to some of those uh, uh, shown here. But I'm gonna highlight something else here. It's up in the upper left of person here. Um, and I wanna draw your attention to a set of these parameters. And these parameters describe the assumptions to be had about the characteristics of this particular person. Um, it communicates those assumptions to this person from its point of creation as well. So it includes, for example, their sex, and their sex is drawn from a set of, of possible, possible sexes, which you can find over here, male and female. Um, there's an SES index, which is a double precision value. It's a continuous value conceptually. Um, might be between zero and one, for example. Um, and that ends up affecting the dynamics of a person and their, their uh, the, the risks to which they're they're exposed. Birth time is another continuous variable. Um, birth weight in grams, etc. Um, these are continuous variables. Sex is a categorical variable or a nominal variable. It's either you know male or female for for this particular model. Um, mother is a relational variable, uh, a relational attribute, a relational parameter. I shouldn't have been saying variables, I should but say parameters or, or properties or attributes. So this is a referencing their mother, a, another person in the in the model. When she, when she gives birth to this baby, the baby remembers who its mom is appropriately enough and hopefully remembers it on Mother's Day. Um, and then there are some ones that are, are, are dichotomous. Um, you know, for example, um, were they born to a mother with uncontrolled uh, gestational diabetes, et cetera? Um, uh, so here we have attributes of a person, a rather profusive number of these. Um, uh, it's a profuse number, which, um, which encode the characteristics of a given person. Um, we could imagine you know, adding more if we wanted to, uh, someone's income level, um, someone's education level, um, someone's country of birth, um, um, et cetera. Um, HMA-based models invite, they welcome, um, and they readily accommodate heterogeneity in ways that are, are quite rich, quite varied. Again, we have categorical nominal, um, types of heterogeneity. We have continuous heterogeneity here, um, like someone's SES, socioeconomic status. 
And we have relational heterogeneity, whereby you know they may have a mother and a father and siblings and and, and so on that are that are set and 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 those are their their family. Um, today's lecture is about this, and it's about understanding this in reference to um, another other types of modeling, which many of those, most of those, probably who are coming here have encountered before compartmental modeling or system dynamics modeling, aggregate models, um, and helping us get our mind around, you know, uh, uh, the, the differences here and, and, and um, differences in scalability, differences in, in, in how we modify models to accommodate heterogeneity and how nimbly we could do so, et cetera. So, so that in many ways, um, is the goal uh, of this uh, of this lecture, um, and uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, static heterogeneity, and I should not say state charts. I don't I don't know um, what uh, why that why that was there. Okay. Um, okay. So um, I'm get, this lecture was designed to have sort of a set of parts, and I'm going to have to whip through, I think, the, the first few parts. But um, uh, I'm going to talk about the, the strike, remind you of the strikingly different organizations of ABMs and aggregate stock and flow models to start. And then we'll go on to a bit of a visual metaphor for two different ways we could capture the same information about heterogeneity. Two alternative ways, equally good for characterizing that information, um, but with very different implications for scalability as, as we get richer and richer sets of information. We're gonna talk about capturing for aggregate models and then for ABMs. So some of you will remember that if we have an aggregate stock and flow model, when we need to capture heterogeneity, when we need to capture differences between people, maybe it's differences in disease states, um, susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered, for example. Um, we divide them into different compartments or different stocks or different state variables. You can use your different you know, words for it. But fundamentally, um, a stock is kind of the, 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 the unit of homogeneity here. And, and if, we, if we need to distinguish things, they need to be in different stocks. Um, now, and, in, and, and we organize the model here, it's subdivided up into pieces according to the states and characteristics of people. So if, if we have this um, for a population um, that uh, is, uh, is divine, we'd like to characterize it for males and separately for females. Um, uh, how would we, how would we, we do that? How would we, if we wanted to capture the fact that, for example, the contact patterns perhaps are different or different probability of transmission because of different hygienic patterns or, or differences in care seeking that would lead to uh, uh, you know, a, a quicker time to treatment for, for women than for men. Um, if we need to, to characterize this, um, the patterns in men and women, what we would do in aggregate stock and flow modeling, um, the most straightforward thing to do would be to take this model and make a copy of it. There'd be susceptible males, exposed males, infective males, recovered males, infection for males, completing latency for males, et cetera, in one part. And then there'd be corresponding structure, mutatis mutandis for females. So we'd have susceptible females, exposed females, infected females, et cetera. We create a a copy of it um, to distinguish them. So we could keep track of how many men are currently infected compared to how many women or how many women are recovered compared to men or what's the cumulative incidence for men and women. Simple idea, widely used. Often it might be used by sex, by age group, uh, by socioeconomic group, et cetera. For agent-based modeling, we have a totally different organization. Stock and flow model, we were organizing it by characteristics and state. We separated things into different states. The model was organized around 
in some ways around the distinctions here of, 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 of different groups. Um, Agent-based modeling, we instead organize it by actors, by individuals, and each individual maintains its own state and its own attributes. And this is gonna have huge implications when it comes to heterogeneity. Also later when it comes to say comorbid conditions progressing along many axes. But, but here we're gonna have each individual, they're gonna have characteristics like their income, and maybe there'll some aspects of state that we won't talk about uh, today. But we're gonna, we're gonna compare these two in my subsequent slides. And to sort of get us to think about this, I, I wanna think about two alternative ways to represent the same underlying situation. And, and they'll end up being analogous to this at some level. So suppose we have a set of objects um, that are distinguished only by their shape and their color. Um, so we have four green squares, we have one green circle, and we have three red circles and one red square. Here we go. Um, not the red square in Moscow. So, um, so uh, I think it would be incontrovertible that you know the information connected here is to shape and color. Um, uh, could be will be retained if I just group these together and you know put all the red square, the green squares together, all the red squares together, uh, and 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 the same thing with these circles. Um, and I think uh, everyone would agree that you know that information, if all I care about is shapes and colors of things, I could just as easily summarize what I see visually here or what I see visually here with this table, right? I could count the number of green squares as four. I could count the number of green circles as one, red squares as one, excuse, uh, red squares as one indeed, um, and red circles as three. Um, okay, in a stock and flow diagram, um, um, we're going to be harking to something more along the lines of this enumeration. Um, so uh, as a reminder, each stock is duplicated once for each subpopulation group. So we'd have susceptibles, males, susceptible females, for example. And, um, and we, we capture that heterogeneity by separating them out and then counting the number in each group. So we count the number of susceptible males. We count the number of infect exposed males, count the number of infected males. We count the number of susceptible females, count the number of exposed females, et cetera. So it's like we're enumerating and for each distinction, green squares, we count the number that of those things, um, the number of susceptibles, the number of exposed uh, susceptible males, the number of exposed males, right? Um, and, uh, and it turns out this is um, uh, this is very straightforward if we just have a few distinctions. As we get a larger number of types of heterogeneity, as we start to worry not only about you know shapes and colors, but also about the border types and whether they're hashed uh, or or you know filled with with colors and their size, et cetera, um, we end up having this kind of explosion of number of types of things that we need to distinguish. We actually have a lot more kind of uh, columns in this table, you know, their size and their, whether or not they're hashed and what their border color is. And it, we end up having a lot of rows and to fill in the count of each and every comp possible combination. So it turns out that, that, you know, if, if we have, um, if we have, uh, like four distinctions uh, that we want to keep track of by, you know, someone's say uh, income, income quartiles, um, and we have seventeen age categories. Um, we have seventeen times four, or fifty-eight possible combinations um, to keep track of uh, within a model. If if we additionally have you know, a, uh, a distinction by their uh, home country from 100 home countries, 
we now have 58 times 100 or 5,800 different possibilities that we need to count up. It's as if we have all these different, these different columns and we have many, many possibilities. And for each possible combination, we're counting the number uh, in that. It, it increases, as we say, geometrically. And for those comfortable with the math notation, you know, it's the product of the number of distinct, of, for each distinction, let's say age, we have 17. And then we multiply it by the number of sexes. So let's, let's suppose we, we represent it as two, 17 times two or 34. And then we represent it by, you know, the number of quartiles of, 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 of income. So we have times four is 116. It just keeps on compounding. It keeps on multiplying. Each new time we add a new distinction, we have to keep track of a much larger number yet, at least doubling it, you know, for, for a, a dichotomous distinction, a distinction into two possibilities. Um, and it's as if we're, we're copying this model, you know, again and again and again, males, females. And then for each of males, we have males of zero to four, five through nine, 10 to 14 years old, 15 to 19, et cetera, all the way up. And then females, each of them. And we end up having this kind of proliferation as this profusion of these different categories. Now, that, that's, that's um, related to when I say that adding heterogeneity to an aggregate model is awkward. That is part of it, that it just becomes this large profusion of different sets of combinations. And, you know, in some models that I've seen in my professional lifetime, we might have, you know, seven different breakdowns um, of, of people into different distinctions and the eyes start to glaze over. But what's more awkward yet is each of those distinctions, when you, when you make that distinction, you, it's, it's something that affects the entire model. You have to subscript all these different things, keep track of separately recovery for men and recovery for women, recovery for men zero to four, boys zero to four, and girls zero to four, recovery for boys five through nine, girls five through nine, et cetera. And we end up getting this kind of, each time we add a dimension of heterogeneity, we have to modify it across the entire model you know, essentially conceptually copy model structure. And system dynamics aggregate, um, system dynamics packages, stock and flow packages, give you some ability to help with this by subscripting, but it also gets very, very messy and awkward and often starts to become almost impenetrable. Agent-based models have a very different way of keeping track of this information. I analogize stock, stock and flow models, their way is, they count, right? They count the number in this category. Count the number separately for males, and susceptible males, susceptible females. Agent-based models are more like this. They, they, each agent has certain characteristics and we have a collection of agents. So rather than keep a track of the count of all possibilities, we just keep track of the individual things. And okay, we have a red square, we have another red square, we have a, sorry, Green square, green square, red circle, red circle, red square, et cetera. Um, okay. Um, so here we're going to have one or more populations composed of these agents. And remember, um, in the model of a population, and when we run the model, we'll see individual agents, and each of them is going to have parameters, right? Um, so maybe we'll have ethnicity, sex, and income. And any given person will have a specific ethnicity, a specific sex, and a specific income. Um, uh, and you know, in compartmental modeling, you'd have to count the number that fall into each category. Um, but in agent-based modeling, we just have the population, and each individual has their characteristics. Um, we don't care whether or not they fall into the same bin here. We don't try to impose pre-specified bins for counting our two people the same or something like that. No, no, no. We just keep track of each person. And there may be people with similar attributes or even the same attributes sometimes, so that's all fine. 
or keep a track of each individual in the population. And it turns out, and we don't have time to go into this uh, here in detail, but it, it turns out that, that it becomes advantageous to, to store this. You might think this is a lot of information. We've got to keep track for each person, their characteristics. And that's true. There's a lot of information here. Um, we're enumerating each person, um, what their characteristics are. But as you start adding in types of heterogeneity, for example, provinces, territories someone lives in now, provinces, territories they were born in, their age group, you know, zero to four versus five to nine, 10 to 14, et cetera, their COVID-19 vaccination status, um, their, their weight categories, their smoking status. If you start to add these up, it actually ends up saving space. It actually is cheaper in terms of how much space you have to store to store each of those individuals with their characteristics, um, rather than dealing with this, in this case, six dimensional cube, all possible combinations, most of which are often gonna be zero or many of which may be zero counts. Um, it's actually much more effective. It's much cheaper to just keep track of the individuals and their individual characteristics. And for those who are mathematically inclined, I, I go through the, um, I go through the, the basic mathematics of here. Um, but it turns out to be there's a break-even point where if you have enough different categories of heterogeneity, or if there are um, many distinctions within a given category. So here we have, you know, um, maybe maybe 13 provinces of and territories in which they they currently live. And this is their birth one, and then other they lived outside of they're born outside of Canada. Um, you know, once we have many for them, the, the number of this number of of cells in this what's conceptually a cube of all possible combinations of values, just it explodes. And what's more notable is how nimble it is to evolve a model like this. So we, we look back at this model. If I wanted to add into this model, someone's province and territory um, at which they currently live, or I wanted to add into this model uh, a characterization of um, their, their current, uh, uh, you know, their current uh, educational level. Um, I could do this by adding a parameter. Uh, if it's a static thing, I could add it as a parameter. And that's a very local change to the model. I, I just go add a parameter in here. So maybe I have income um, and I want to add an SES index and I, you know, can, can add that in very straightforwardly. By contrast, I had argued you know, adding a dimension of heterogeneity to a model like this, where, you know, I, I want to now include age. It's an, maybe a, right now it's just a sex-based model. And I want to now include age so we can capture age impacts on infectious period and latent period. That requires me to change the entire model. It requires me to go through, I, I'm exaggerating a bit, but change very large fractions of the model. And this, this ends up, really taking a toll and how nimbly you can you can explore aspects of of heterogeneity it turns out moreover it's it's much more effective if you have interactions between factors like you have occupation and age and really only certain combinations are possible you, you can explore that in an individual level more neatly and again i'm not going to go into this but Suffice it to say that, that storing each person actually saves much more space at a certain point, but more to the point, it's much cleaner and more nimble to evolve the model. The model is much more understandable because instead of every bit of the model that we have to worry about heterogeneity, having all these different types of concerns tangled up, you know, having to look at the age and the sex and the province of birth and the current province and the weight category. We, we instead have 
things neatly parceled into their pieces. We just have, you know, sex being as an attribute of this person. If it ends up impacting certain features of their per, of their procession, among among some of the dynamics, we can take it into account. But we don't have to have every bit of the model tangled up with sex just to maintain that information in the way that we do with uh, an aggregate model uh, like like this, where you know every every bit of it, we have to drag around the fact we're dealing with this sex category, this age category, this income category, et cetera. It's, it's, uh, so heterogeneity in agent-based models is, is nimble to add, nimble to remove, surgical in, in what it affects, and you can electively have things depend on it without it getting tangled all throughout your model. Heterogeneity, in other words, is very well supported in agent-based models. Moreover, it's supported in three different ways. Um, it's supported in ways that we saw with that, with that initial model we were looking at. And I had a slide on this, but somehow I'm not, not finding it. Yes, continuous heterogeneity. Remember that? We had here um, SES index, maybe between zero and one, for example. Uh, we have dis discrete heterogeneity. We saw that here with their sex, drawn male or female from possible sexes. And we have aspects of relational heterogeneity. So we had you know, them know who their mother was or who, where their home was, et cetera. Um, these may not seem grand in their implications, but if you reflect on the fact that within a, an aggregate model, capturing, capturing something like continuous heterogeneity, continuous age, is just not possible. We have to declare, and it's typically one uniform set of age categories across the entire model. And that's the set of age categories to rule them all. Um, and that's the distinction. That's the level of granularity we have on age. In an age-based model, each person can maintain their age um, in a continuous way. And if we want to divide it up um, for infants by months or by days, and we want to divide it up for uh, older adults into shorter periods, but for mid-aged adults into larger for certain summaries, if we want to compare it against data, that's sliced and diced in different ways from the population, there's no problem to do so. We have the data as finely grained as we want with no added cost. Just keeping a, for each person a double precision value, you know, 1.34 versus an integer versus, you know, a, a set of possible categories. It's, there's no real significant cost. There's no complications from it. So when it comes to heterogeneity, we have this profound difference in terms of how we support um, uh, capturing differences in the population from aggregate SD models. And it, and it can be analogized to this sort of distinction that we explored. It's the distinction between keeping track of each of these elements one by one and and, and living with that versus trying to enumerate all possible character po combination of characteristics and counting them. At some point, it's just much easier to maintain these. And as it turns out, we'll see that that will allow us to maintain history information on each of these too. We'll be getting into state next time and, and maintaining state. So in, um, in, in HMAS models, um, uh, we can readily capture continuous information. There's no need to coarse grain dimensions of heterogeneity. In contrast to aggregate uh, system dynamics models or stock and flow models, I should really say, where um, you know often we end up making compromises on what heterogeneity we can maintain, have a smaller number of dimensions of it, and we coarse grain it into into sort of predefined. Uh, you know, categories of, of age or, or of uh, income level or what have you. Um, uh, here, adding a new dimension of heterogeneity 
um, uh, will multiply the size of the model. In agent-based models, it just adds adds a little bit more information. You have to keep track of another four bytes of information for each agent. Um, and I'll be with Maurice in just a second. The real bottleneck, though, for agent-based models is the running time. For a system dynamics model, it doesn't matter. For a stock and flow model, it doesn't matter whether you have a thousand people um, here or 10,000 or 10 million or 10 billion. It's just a number. And you can simulate it just as fast if it's a large population and small population. For an agent-based model, population is, is a direct driver of, of, of cost, of, of running time. If you double the size of the, the the size of the population, you will at least double the running time of the agent-based model. If you double the size of the population in a, in a in a stock and flow model, doesn't change the running time at all. Um, it's adding heterogeneity that hurts for aggregate stock and flow models. It's it's increasing the population size that hurts for agent-based models. And we're going to be coming back to this issue of hurt um, in a future lecture. So Maurice, uh, I, I think I'll close my remarks there. I had to abbreviate a lot of that because of, uh, uh, you know, we, I wanted to spend some time with the endogenous, exogenous, uh, uh, ignore distinction, but I'm glad to answer questions here. Yeah. Uh, Nate, I just a question, um, you know, in, in yeah. the system dynamics realm, one of the challenges, uh, with representing heterogeneity is uh, it's usually done through a coflow structure. Um, yes, where we you... can represent it through coflows. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. and and that I you know I think creates all kinds of difficulties when uh, you're you uh, can you know kind of empty the stock of a of a characteristic and and suddenly the model will blow up. Um, because it's uh, it's zeroed yes. out and maybe divided by that stock somewhere else. Um, is is there a a, a similar kind of um, a technical risk in agent based modeling that you can think of? Um, no, there isn't. Um, I'm I'm I've long long been um, a, a, a a fan with wariness of coflows. I mean, I I I I was impressed by so. So we're getting into office hours materials here, so um, people can can feel free to to stick around or or go as needed. Um, but I think I'll you know, before I stop the recording, I'll comment. Um, Coflows have a great deal of elegance um, in capturing an aspect of heterogeneity um, in a, in a kind of uh, with with minimal structure, and particularly allow you to look at this issue. Uh, most commonly of, of kind of mean value, right? The, the, the mean um, by essentially looking at this ratio um, between them, um, uh, the, the mean um, uh, separating two, two quantities, for example. And um, it, it doesn't allow you to capture the distribution, but often it allows you to to capture some aspect of, of heterogeneity uh, within it. Um, but it is very limited, and you're absolutely right that you can get these um, these perverse, you know, divide by zero effects, or or sort of singularities, or or periods where the ratio doesn't make any sense, et cetera, with with coflows, and um, those are very stock and flow. <laughs> those are very stock and flow specific conditions, and. This is a type of subtlety and a type of worry that just really doesn't come in in the agent-based space. Um, it's um, it has a very much the the flavor uh, of um, a type of concern that is is um, fairly specific to the to the stock flow formulation. And in particularly that mode of of trying to capture the effects of heterogeneity on um, you know in in the form of this elegant parallel structures of flows. Um, so um, 
yeah, it's one of the reasons I view them with some wariness. Um, uh, and uh, I think they're elegant, uh, but I consider them, um, uh, you know, as, as having their real complexity sometimes. And they're not a, a silver bullet that allows you by any means to capture, you know, uh, a, a heterogeneity in, in a general way. Um, they can serve in, in some cases, but as you say, they can have perverse dynamic behavior. Yeah. I don't know if that's helpful at all. That, that does answer it. I, mean, I, yeah. I was going to say, you know, the, um, uh, with the, the limited experience I have with uh, working in NetLogo, for example, um, there is this uh, 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 risk of nested decision making that can, can creep in. Um, to a, 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 a net, uh, an agent-based model and, and vastly uh, multiply the, the computational in intensity um, and, so, and you know, grind it to a yeah. halt, essentially. Um, that, that's one, one thing that's almost sometimes yeah. equally perplexing um, in the, in yeah. the uh, try, trying to uh, diagnose those sorts of things. Yeah. So, so, and, and this is kind of the general theme on which I close this lecture, which is, um, you know, the, um, we end up, there's no free lunch here and you end up paying for flexibility often with a uh, computational burden and, um, and, 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 you know, you play for flexibility for the flexibility sometimes with overzealous um you know uh ebullience and adding adding components into your model that um that are actually not demonstrably central to your goals uh with the model and that end up um making the modeling process less nimble as well. It's not merely that the model runs slower. Sometimes by adding things in, you know, you get entangled in issues of data collection or in issues of model formulation or or issues of um, you know picking uh, picking um, how to best calibrate the model or what have you. Um, that get more burdensome as you as you add components in. And uh, I, I, I think, you know, when we're working with health scientists, uh, as I do in virtually all of my, all of my work and, and large teams of health, health scientists often um, uh, and health practitioners, um, you know, this, this is an impulse that comes very naturally to an epidemiologist to want to break things down by more and more and have more and more heterogeneity. And, and you know, there, there's, there's good reasons to have a central concern about equity and about, um, um, you know, how phenomena differ uh, uh, for, for people with different characteristics. And, um, but, you know, to, um, to use one's time most effectively because of the opportunity costs involved, it's important to marshal it intelligently for the things that matter most and to proceed in a way that will highlight those things and 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 uh, instead of doing, you know, putting all things in um, uh, early on that you think might matter, it's it's a matter of layering them in and learning and figuring out judiciously what what to add next. Um, you can move a lot faster that way than if, if they all get added in, um, you know, um, at, at the start. So I think there's computational burden, but then there's pro, um, modeling process burden. Um, and both, both are, you know, very, very important to reflect on and to, to sort of check our initial impulses to kind of elaborate by adding one more one more thing into the model um and in a way in system dynamics modeling um you know the, the use of stock and flow models um very widely has that pushback because you know going and stratifying it by age is a it's such a weighty operation um that 
it forces us to think, do we absolutely need to do this? Do we have evidence that you know, will allow us to make use of this information to calibrate the model, inform the model, to parameterize the model, to compare with the model? Do we really care about the outcomes by, by this new category, say age, and, and to really think that through before undertaking it? And I, I think that that's a healthy reflection um, that's not enforced for agent-based modeling because it is so easily added. And, and that's the, you know, that's, that's the opportunity, but it's also the risk. Um, so uh, yeah, hope, hopefully those comments have some significance.